Welcome back to Nick Geo. For the very first time, we're gonna do something a little different and look at a territory of another sovereign nation. Now, we already did a Nordic country for my first video, that being Norway, check it out here. However, today I'd like to take a moment to look at a different territory of a different Nordic country. So Greenland is officially a territory of the Kingdom of Denmark, which still has a high level of autonomy. It's the world's biggest island, which so many people seem to be fascinated by, yet I feel like so few people know much about it. And that very reason is why I decided I should probably make one on that. We are going to check out the five largest cities in Greenland. And here's a little hint, none of them are very large at all. Matter of fact, some of them might only qualify as towns. <laughs> and I thought the Burkina Faso cities were small. Anyhow, before I begin to ramble, let's jump into number five. All right, now bear with me here. Greenlandic language is very much an enigma for us English-speaking U.S. citizens that are monolingual. First city we're going to talk about is called Asiat. Asiat comes in at number five. It's located in western Greenland in the Kekatelik municipality on an archipelago of the same name. You're going to find that a lot of these are on islands and archipelagos and on the coast because this is basically the only part of Greenland that isn't a giant ice field. This is all settled in what is known as the Disco Bay, having a population of around 3,000. The name translates in Greenlandic to spider, although nobody really knows why because there's no historical evidence to tie this to. I'd imagine there aren't many spiders in the entire island. In 1759, Norwegian settlers, which at the time would have been joined with Denmark settlers, founded this settlement before it was moved to where it is currently in 1763. The villagers are said to have moved here so that they could become whalers, and unfortunately they brought with them smallpox, which killed off a lot of the natives. It's a very familiar story for most of us in this continent. On the bright side, though, the 20th century would see much more growth for the region. Asia was the first town to open a school for women to obtain secondary education in 1932. This building still stands today and functions as a library. Fishing, shipbuilding, and tourism make up a big part of the economy here and there is a very tiny airport primarily there is only one road that kind of runs through the whole town and you can see all the colorful houses along the sides as you make your way down you'll notice this to be a bit of a theme here but the summertime is when there's going to be the most outdoor activity as it's not you know extremely frigid a popular outdoor excursion is the midnight sun marathon which is exactly what it sounds like that owes itself to the fact that the earth's axis tilt gives sunlight at midnight during this time of year in August, they usually host the Nipia Rock Festival, the largest one in the region. A big draw for visitors is the harbor and the Asiat Museum. This museum heavily focuses on the history, especially around kayaking and dog sledding. And you get to see some nice architecture, namely the town church and library. Oh, and also a bit of a running theme for all of these. From September to April, the northern lights are pretty visible. At number four, we have Kakotak. This would be the capital of the southern Kujalik municipality. Now, this one could also go back to prehistoric times, and it also has a population of roughly 3,000. The earliest signs of civilization that we still see represent the Sakak and the Dorset cultures, but the 10th century Valsi ruins are far more prominent, dating to the Norse colonization. Valsi translates to Whale Island, which became a UNESCO heritage site in 2017, and it's said to have been established by Eric the Red's uncle. Oh, I'm not going to get this right. Johild's church can also be found nearby, said to be the first Christian church ever built in North America. Around the 12th century, the Inuit people group known as the Thule arrived on the massive island. Now, they left far less land and structural evidence, but there were plenty of objects found to show their existence. And like the last city, the 18th century would bring in the Danes. The city as it's known today was founded by Anders Olsen in 1775. Near the main fountain square sits the Kokortok Museum, which is inside one of the oldest functioning buildings in the town. This fountain is also the only one in the entire territory of Greenland. The town can also work as a bit of an open air gallery thanks to the Stone and Man Project, which was basically a bunch of Nordic artists carving sculptures into the rocks and boulders all over the town. There are now over 40 of them. Main form of tourism here is mostly cruise tourism, and they actually have their own heliport. Mostly you get around by this thing that we call walking. Most of the town is connected via trails. And if you want motor vehicles, you're going to need all-terrain rides. And of course, a snowmobile might come in handy. Now, farming isn't exactly something you're going to find a lot of in Greenland, for obvious reasons, but you will find sheep farmers, especially in this area. Surrounding this, you're sure to see arctic foxes, snow hares, and even reindeer, and like in Norway, there are fjords everywhere. In the distance, you can see the pleasant backdrop of the Pinju Mountains, and just outside the town rests Lake Tasersuak. And a little ways outside of the town, in the summertime, you can actually go to some hot springs. Coming in at number three, we have the city of Ilulisat. This translates to iceberg. 
You'll find this if you head back north a little in the Avanata municipality. Its population is around 4,700, and it's said that there are almost as many dog sleds here as there are people. I imagine that's a bit of an exaggeration. The year 1741 would see the town established by the Danish as a trading post. The ice fjord that's named after it has actually made the city the most popular one in terms of tourism. Unfortunately, climate change is causing this to melt at a much more alarming rate, which I find rather depressing. This was addressed in 2008 with an Arctic Ocean conference held in this city. The conference was held between Canada, North Norway, Russia, the US, and Denmark. Basically, that was to dispute territorial claims in, well, the Arctic Ocean. If you haven't noticed, that's all the countries that surround it. Here you can also experience what is known as a turf house, and while they are very small and were used recently, whole families could fit in them, and they did serve the purpose of being very warm. Now, the city's most appealing structure is easily the Zion Church, which sits right by the aforementioned Disco Bay. Geographically, it's also one of the driest parts of Greenland, getting less than 11 inches of precipitation on average per year. That said, it is one of the sunniest, which means if you go here, please bring sunscreen. Just because it's cold doesn't mean that those sun rays aren't gonna torch your skin. There are actually several museums here, most notably the Art Museum, which is full of art by the Danish artist named Emanuel Peterson. Just outside of the city lies another tiny airport, just like the other smaller cities. Now, considering how many people are said to have dog sleds, I would imagine that's the common way to get around, but it's also used for a very popular sport. In March and April, they actually have championship races. Apparently, you can also hear these things howling all throughout the city, and you better believe that there are also water taxis. Now, if you go out on the water, a little bit out outside of the region sits the Eki Glacier, being the most visited one. It's very common to see massive chunks break off, and this is known as calving. There are also small settlements that exist just outside of this town, which give you a really good look at the super rural environments. Coming in as the runner-up at number two, we have Sisi Mute. This would be the capital of the Kekata municipality. This name means residence at the foxholes and goes back similar to Kakortok, to the Sikak, Dorset, and Thule cultures. Therefore, its history is very similar, and it was officially completely settled by the Danes in 1764. Today, it has a pretty even mix between Inuit tribes and Danes, coming in at a population of around 5,500. Compared to the other cities that we looked at, this is one of the fastest growing ones, mostly because of migrants from the smaller towns moving inward towards it. Similarly, unlike the previous cities that we looked at, Sisimut actually has a higher rise apartment blocks, which were erected in the 1960s. But there's still a pretty high presence of old colonial buildings with all the colors and the prefabricated wood that we looked at earlier. What's also different is there wasn't really any signs of prior Norse settlement before the Danes came in. Believe it or not, actually, Dutch whalers had a stronghold on this before the 18th century. Until a guy named Jacob Severin came in and quartered the market, this led to a series of fights leading to the Dutch leaving by 1739. Moreover, there's still a pretty fair amount of 18th century buildings that stand here. Bethel Kirken, or Bethel Church, the oldest surviving church in Greenland can be found there to this day. I believe it dates back to 1775. You also take note to a far newer one that was built in the 1920s. This further represents the city's mix of colonial and modern architecture. The placement of the Red Zion Church specifically allows for a great view of it in the backdrop of just about anywhere. Oh, and if you love Chinese food, like me, this is actually the only city in Greenland that you can get Chinese food. The restaurant is called Misigisak. All of this rests along the large waterway known as the Davis Strait, falling between Canada and Greenland, and for the hiking fans, they have something known as the Arctic Circle Trail. There's a whole hiking festival held in July. In the wintertime, CC Mute hosts something called the Arctic Circle Race. It's supposedly the most difficult cross-country race. It runs for three days and is about a 160-kilometer spree. Like the other small cities, getting around on foot is common, as well as boat, but there are taxis as well. And if this isn't obvious, the museums are going to be the best way to get a look at the culture deeper. Oh, help me with this work. If one needed to get to the airport, you would have to get to the other side of what is known as the Kangar Loar Sunagwag Bay. There's no way I got that. With the twin summit backdrop. If that's not neat enough, then the Sasak summit towers over everything before eventually falling into the Amarlok Fjord. And that brings us to number one, the largest city in the entire island, its capital known as Nuuk. Its population is bigger than the other four cities combined, coming in around 20,000, being established as Godthab by the Danish in 1728. As a matter of fact, this city is said to hold about a third of the island's entire population, showing just how sparsely it is populated. Now, Nuuk gets its name from the Inuit settlement that existed prior to the Europeans. It is the Greenlandic word for Cape. This is also the world's northernmost capital, being just higher than Iceland's Reykjavik. 
unless if you only count sovereign capitals. Similar to the other towns, this existed for thousands of years and then was followed up by the Vikings and later the Thules. And like one of the other smaller towns, a lot of natives were killed by smallpox. However, with that, even a lot of the early settlers died of scurvy, which were mostly prisoners. Like most colonization projects, a lot of the local tradition was suppressed, but this actually started to come to an end as early as 1861. The first Greenlandic newspaper allowed them to have a bit of an identity. And today, there are actually more Inuit natives than the Danes or the Norse, not just in this city, but on the whole island. If we skip to World War II, this identity would grow even stronger as it teamed up with Canada and the US to form a consulate. Modern apartment blocks that don't date back to the mid 20th century are popping up everywhere, so understandably, it's the city that's going to give the most architectural diversity. Some people will throw around the term Old Nuke, which is going to refer to the older buildings that are in the outskirts and surrounding the center of the city. I guess kind of like a suburb, but eh. And you can even get a look at some of the old cemeteries. Similarly, it's also got far more roads and much more familiar transportation methods, including buses. The majority of car owners in Greenland live in Nuke, which makes sense because none of the roads connect to the other small towns. Obviously, this is also where you're going to find the biggest airport, simply named Nuke Airport, mostly using the Air Greenland Airline. The Nuke Stadium is primarily used for football games, soccer for my American viewers, which can hold up to 2,000 people. The British rock band Nazareth actually performed there one time. The Katuak Cultural Center is a massive building that holds concerts, expositions, and even works as a cinema. The auditoriums can hold up to 1,500 people, and its shape is supposed to be the resemblance of the Northern Lights. Near the outskirts, you'll find a lot more of the traditional buildings and single-family housing units that I mentioned earlier, with many of the churches built in the same style that we saw previously, such as the Church of Our Savior. There's also a statue of Hans Egid, the Norwegian-Danish missionary that founded the town, goddess of the sea statue, and a statue Statue of Seals. Statues are cool. Now you can actually visit Hans's home, which was built in 1721. This is the oldest functioning building in Greenland. Functioning, you know, not counting ruins and stuff. The city has several museums, including the Nuke Art Museum, which is so visually appealing just on the outside, let alone the actual artwork. There is some art in it by Andy Warhol. Now the only university on the entire island is found here, simply named the University of Greenland, opened in 1987. There's actually only a small amount of enrollment because most students that want to study are going to go to mainland Denmark. However, a few classes do teach English. Now considering that the administrative center of the entire island is here, public sector makes up a lot of the employment. To Pilak Travels, where one would go if you'd like to experience some climbing adventures. And the Nuke Center is the only mall on all of Greenland, at least in the sense that we US citizens think of malls. As far as the land geography, it's right by the Nuke Kangarua, a fjord running into the Labrador Sea, which is an extension of the Atlantic Ocean around the island's tip. It's actually formed when the North American and Greenlandic plates separated millions of years ago. Along this, there are three main islands named Sermitsiak, Kekartarsuak, and Kornup Kekartarsua. As far as mountains go, you can actually see the Sermitsiak from anywhere in the city. And this reaches a height of about 4,000 feet. This is located on an island of the same name, which obviously sits nearby. And I think that's going to do it for this video. Like I said at the top, so little is known about this fascinating island known as Greenland that's so sparsely populated for how huge it is. Oh, and speaking of which, I feel like I gotta throw this in. Keep in mind that most flat maps lie to you, and while it is a very large island, it's not as big as it's usually depicted. Like, it's not actually that big. It usually looks like it's about the size of South America, and really it's about the size of Argentina. Like I said, that's still pretty big, but if you took nothing else away from this video, take that. I thank you all for tuning in and sticking around for the entire video. As usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. To those of you that have already done so, thank Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Nick, out.